Well, today I feel like it's appropriate to start talking about plans. Just want to let you guys know that the plans for today originally were a little bit different than what you have seen and heard, uh, but we're well with it as we often do. As, as uh, General Mattis says, planning is everything, but the plan is nothing. I think my coworkers will attest to the fact that I like to make plans for lots of different things. They'll ask me a question, I'll be like, well, here's three ways to solve that. Let's start with one, and that probably won't work, so let's go to two, and we'll have three just in case. So the plan for today was actually for the sanctuary to complete, be completely still decorated for Vacation Bible School, which, is, which has happened this past week, uh, but because of our uh, in, uh, uh, inadvertent lightning strike, I don't know what you call that, uh, we don't have technology and TVs and screens, so we had to move over to the gym. And so all, if you want to see what Vacation Bible School looked, well, some of it's... No, we took the decorations down, didn't we? Yeah, we did, because we're on the ball like that. Uh, some of it still, <laughs> we got to do that this afternoon. Um, our, our hope had been for you guys to see what it was going to be like and experience what it was going to be like a little bit. Uh, in actuality, the songs that we just sung together are the songs that we sang for VBS this week. Uh, and so, like, you may have looked around and seen some people doing motions, because there were motions to those songs. Um, and the plan was for me to be here today, so um, you guys are stuck with me. So I guess I apologize in advance. We'll, we'll talk about where Pastor Lane is here in just a minute. Uh, it got me thinking, though, uh, with, with what is going on uh, right now um, as Southern Baptists is actually what we're going to be talking about today in, in a little bit of a different way. Uh, it got me thinking, what is in a name how many of you guys immediately went to, I read that, that's in Romeo and Juliet, right? Shakespeare said, was in a name, a rose by any, any other name would smell just as sweet, right? Uh, it sometimes makes me think about my own name, okay? Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever uh, done one of those little, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of research to find out, what does my name mean? What does it say about me, or what might it say about me? Uh, I like what my name says about me, so props to my mom and dad for picking a good name, I think. All right, the name Andrew means strong and manly. I will take it. All right, my middle name, Stephen, uh, means king or, or crown. All right, it's a Greek word for crown. I'll take that one. That's awesome. Strong, manly, king. If I could live up to that, I suppose I'm going the right direction. My last name, though, is a little bit unique, and some of you probably understand that. My last name is Desko. Uh, it's Polish. It got changed when my family immigrated. And uh, the joke in my family is that it simply means poor Polish farmer. And uh, some of you guys are laughing because you're thinking of the Polish jokes you know. Uh, tell me later. I'd, I'd love to collect those. All right? We can joke about it together. But what's in the name Baptist? Or more specifically, what's in the name Southern Baptist? And I think it's extremely relevant today because... Over the next few days, this week specifically, you will hear about Southern Baptists in the national news. It is inevitable. And that's because the Southern Baptist Convention is meeting starting on Tuesday. Okay? That's where Pastor Lane is. Now, Mark mentioned the Pastors Conference. That is a conference for pastors that takes place alongside it. Uh, it takes place starting today and then tomorrow, Monday, and then the actual Southern Baptist Convention starts on Tuesday and goes on into Wednesday. And we're going to talk about exactly what that looks like, because I feel like it's really important for us, if we call ourselves Southern Baptists, to understand what that means. You might have an understanding of it, and you might not. My hope today is that you'll have a better one by the time you leave. So Southern Baptists are going to be in the news because we're meeting, all right? Uh, it's going to be on the national news. People are going to be talking about what happens. People are going to be interpreting what happens. It's going to be out there. Uh, more specifically, um, things are going to be talked about because Southern Baptists have been in the news over the past few weeks. Uh, Pastor Lane has, has talked about this. In fact, he did a whole uh, Facebook Live on June the 1st uh, to talk about the findings of the third-party investigation uh, into long-term mishandling and cover-up of abuse by a group of people within the Southern Baptist Convention's executive committee. 
And so that is posted, archived on our church's Facebook page. And so if you want more information about that, he takes a, a really deep dive into that information. Well, the task force that called for that investigation is going to be making their report at the SBC this week. And so more will be talked about that. And just so you guys know, it was always the plan, it was the plan from day one that those findings be made public. Okay, it's not some leaked document that caused a big stir. That was, was all done on purpose. So the SBC begins on Tuesday, Lane's attending, uh, as well as representatives from a lot of other churches. Okay, we have 47,000, over 47,000 churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, not every church sends people to go. It's, it's totally optional, but there will be a lot of people that are there. So I feel like today was a really good time for us to ask, what does it mean? What does it mean for us to be Southern Baptists? What does it mean for us as Emmanuel Baptist Church? What does it mean for you personally? Okay, and I thought about this. If you're not a Southern Baptist, should you be one or become one? Um, and I don't mean to cause a stir, but like if you think about it, like if you are one, what does it mean for you staying one? Now, my, my goal, honest goal, is to encourage you that the answer should be, if I'm not one, I should become one. And if I am one already, I should stay one. Okay, the answer is going to be yes. Now, this is not a call for some mass exodus, I promise. But I do want to give you guys some guarantees. Our church is not a cult, okay? Your decision to choose to be here is yours to make. All right, just, let's just make that clear. So my goal is that after learning more about who we are as Southern Baptists, you're going to lean into that more than you have before. So... Let's take a quick look at Scripture, though, because if I think we're going to talk about anything related to us following Jesus as we do, we should take a look at what God has to say. Well, what does God have to say about us being Baptists? Well, actually, pretty much nothing, specifically. All right, there's no verse, thou shalt be this, or thou shalt not be that. But throughout the history of the church, followers of Jesus have asked and experimented with how do we make disciples together? All right, if you take a look at some of Jesus' final words to his disciples, like Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, where he's meeting with them right before he ascends into heaven. This is after the resurrection. He says, all authority has been given to me on heaven, in heaven and on earth. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you to the end of the age. And then you skip ahead to the book of Acts. Acts 1.8, Jesus is with his disciples, and he says, power will come upon you through the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we can take a look at 2,000 years of church history to see how followers of Jesus have taken those verses and put their feet to the ground and done those things. Now, it's interesting because that uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria— we have to remember that those, those were real places. And the disciples really went there to make more disciples. In fact, the literary structure of the book of Acts is the disciples in Jerusalem, then the disciples in Judea, then the disciples in Samaria, and then the disciples to the ends of the earth. So I think there is some benefit. There might be some benefit to identifying your personal Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all that kind of stuff. But it makes a little bit more sense to me to read those verses geographically rather than metaphorically. And so when we talk about the ends of the earth, well, yeah, that's my brothers and sisters in Brazil. But that's also like across the street in my neighborhood right here in Savannah because we don't live in the Middle East. So how do we then make disciples of all nations? How have Southern Baptists decided to accomplish this goal together? Well, the answer really is one word, all right? And that word is cooperation, all right? Doing it together. And cooperation is one of the defining features of our denomination. And let's take a step back real quick and just talk about what that even means. What is a denomination? Because there are many of them. Uh, I don't think it's even possible to keep count because new ones get formed all the time. But a denomination is, at its simplest form, is a group of churches that agree and cooperate on how to do church, how to be the church. So you might think of Baptists as a denomination. 
Southern Baptists more specifically are a denomination because there are other Baptist denominations. You might think of the Lutheran Church, the United Methodist Church, which is also in the news right now, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, the Anglicans. Those are denominations. For the most part, we would consider ourselves all Christians because on the foundational level, we believe the right things about Jesus and salvation. When it comes to secondary theological issues, we begin to differ and differ enough that it becomes difficult for us to worship together in a church like this. And so a denomination is simply churches that agree together on how to be the church. Now, it's important to point out that nobody makes the rules for how denominations operate. Each one decides for itself. They, denominations are autonomous, okay? And one feature of the Southern Baptist denomination is that the churches themselves are also autonomous, okay? So for Emmanuel Baptist Church, everything that we have is I mean, it's ours. Nobody, nobody owns it and tells us how to do it. So, like, the resources that come in, Emmanuel Baptist Church decides on its own how to allocate those. The ministries that we have and will have in the future and all that kind of stuff, those, those are our choice as well. Even the way that we cooperate with other churches and other organizations, those, that choice is ours to make. Nobody tells us what we should do. Now, they might make recommendations and suggestions, and we certainly go to the other people for advice, but... We're the ones that have the ultimate say. And there are three basic ways that most typical Southern Baptist churches choose to cooperate. You can think of them as three different levels. Okay? The first level is a local association. So Emmanuel Baptist Church cooperates with other churches here in Savannah in what is known as the Savannah Baptist Association. Okay? So it's just a network of churches here in Chatham County and a little bit beyond that that work to minister to people in the Savannah area because we can do more together than we can do on our own. That, that's really what it comes down to is the ability to pool our resources so that uh, we can do more ministry. So you got the local level. Then you've got the state level, all right? Uh, this is Emmanuel Baptist Church cooperating with the Georgia Baptist Mission Board, okay? And on the state level, there are things that Baptists do that you might have heard of like disaster relief, okay, or Baptist collegiate ministries, or the fact that we actually have some Baptist colleges here in Georgia, just like some other states have Baptist colleges in there. And most of the time, those colleges are associated with Southern Baptists at a state level. Okay, so you've got the local association, and you've got the state association, and then you have the national level, okay, and that is the Southern Baptist Convention. And there are a lot of things that they do, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Now, each of these, you've got the local, you've got the state, and you've got the national. They adopt standards okay, for members in good standing, and Emmanuel Baptist Church meets all of those. So the Southern Baptist Convention, as a national convention, has existed since 1845. Okay, so it's like 100, almost 180 years. And it exists to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth, okay? Now, Baptists have been around longer than that, okay? We've got to go back a couple more centuries to the Protestant Reformation and a group called the Anabaptists, okay, that really felt like it was important to emphasize believers' baptism. See, because over in Europe, the practice was is that a child— would get baptized as a child. That was not only their entrance into the church, but also their entrance into uh, civil state society because the state and the church were so closely connected. That's why, like, when, if your family does genealogy reports, if your family comes from Europe, they look for baptism records because that was, like, the proof that you existed. Okay, there were, there were no other records. It was, it was the baptism records back then. Well, through the Protestant Reformation, people began to examine Scripture and say, and see that, well, baptism is really for believers only. And it didn't, not, it didn't not cause a stir when people decided to get re-baptized, okay? A lot of people didn't like that. In fact, for a time, it was illegal in some countries, and the punishment for getting re-baptized was getting baptized a third time permanently. So uh, that's, that's our heritage. woo uh, No, we don't do that. We, don't, we joke about how long we hold people under the water when we do baptism, but we promise we'll let you back up. 
So Baptists had been around for a long time, but Southern Baptist as a denomination started here in Georgia in 1845. Now, I need to be a little transparent at certain parts in, in our time together this morning. As followers of Jesus, there are parts of our Southern history and heritage that we should not be proud of. And the fact that slavery was a major factor in the formation of the Southern Baptist Convention is one of those things. See, it was started as a desire to send slave owners as missionaries. And we might look back now and be like, that is a bit reprehensible. And that is correct. But that is the reality of our history. So it exists as a, as a dark spot on our history, among many other things. And it did drive a wedge between Southern Baptists and other Baptists in the country at the time. So while it, it remains that dark spot on our history, our denomination does continue to make progress in this area uh, regarding rec racial reconciliation, uh, public repentance, and concerted efforts for diversity at every level. So at these three levels, remember you got local, you got state, and you've got national. I want to point out that there are three primary ways that churches cooperate together. And, and these are the three things that I want you to be able to leave with today, understanding and taking to heart. Okay, so the first way that Southern Baptists cooperate is with our heads. Okay, with our heads. The three ways, by the way, are the head, the heart, the hands and the feet. We're going to lump those last two together. So maybe it's four, maybe it's three. You do the math, however you want to count those, okay? We cooperate with our heads. And what I mean by that is that Southern Baptists cooperate in the way that we think about theology. All right, so cooperating churches in the Southern Baptist Convention do a, affirm a theological document. And it's called the Baptist Faith and Message. All right, and there's a year attached to it, and the year is 2000, because... The Baptist Faith and Message has been uh, edited and updated occasionally over the years. So the Baptist Faith and, Me Faith and Message, or it's just simply uh, shortened to B, F, and M, 2000, all right, is the theological document that lays out what it is that Southern Baptists believe. And I encourage you to read it. You can find it. Just Google it, B, F, and M, 2000. It'll take you to the Southern Baptist Convention's website, sbc.net. We also post this on our website because it's a great summary of what we believe, in, in, at least on a foundational level. Because Southern Baptists agree on certain things theologically. These are important truths about things like God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. What else did, what else did I write down? I want to make sure I got all these right. Sin. Yeah, that's important. We'll talk about <laughs> salvation. Uh, and some ecclesiological or church tenets such as believers baptism and male pastors all right now there is room though in the baptist faith and message for churches to express themselves contextually okay so some churches will where, where the baptist faith and message is open or purposefully vague because it's areas where scripture is vague some churches will say well we believe this and that's okay and some churches will say, well, it's not laid out, so you can believe whatever. And that, that's fine, too. But I promise that it is clear where it needs to be. Um, so unlike maybe, you know, generations ago, decades ago, Southern Baptist churches in different places, like from city to city, they might not all look the same anymore on the outside or on, on the inside. But at our heart level, we really do believe the same thing. So we cooperate with our heads, but we also cooperate with our hearts with our hearts. So by hearts, I mean that we cooperate on the things that we are passionate about, mainly getting the gospel of Jesus out to a lost and dying world. Now, this is uh, a point to make that unfortunately, we as Southern Baptists have gained a reputation less for what we are for and more for what we are against. Uh, now, are we against sin? Absolutely. Should we be against sin in the culture we live in? Yes. But not at the expense of being a bully about it. And 
our prioritization of the gospel doesn't mean that we stay silent about injustices either. So I'm not sure it's benefited any, anybody when Southern Baptists go on cultural witch hunts. I'm not sure why we act surprised when a sinful culture celebrates sin. We should point out sin, sure. Should we fear it? No. So we cooperate with our heads, we cooperate with our hearts, and we cooperate with our hands and feet. And by hands and feet, I mean how we cooperate as Southern Baptists in loving our neighbors, in things like service and evangelism. So one of the main ways that we cooperate as Southern Baptists with our hands and feet, uh, especially financially speaking, is through something that you might have heard of, and it's called the Cooperative Program. All right, uh, let's just take a poll. How many of you have ever heard of the Cooperative Program? Raise your hands. All right, perfect. It makes me feel really good that not all of you have, because I, I like explaining this, because it actually is a really cool thing. So the Cooperative Program is how Southern Baptists pool their resources to do ministry around the world. Okay? It has not always existed, by the way. Remember, we talked about Southern Baptists existing as a denomination since 1845? Well, the cooperative program only goes back to 1925. And it was started, for what I believe, is a really good reason. Now, let's, uh, let's see if we can lay the context out. And, by the way, I'm not saying that this is wrong, because some churches and denominations work like this and function like this, and do amazing ministry today, just like this. So prior to 1925, let's, well, actually, Emmanuel Baptist Church did exist prior to 1925. We were nine years old at the time. No, 11 years old at the time. So let's take, let's take a, a, time, a time travel back to Emmanuel Baptist Church, uh, 1915, okay? One year after we start, we're, we're downtown in Savannah. And occasionally, I don't know how often, but we would have missionaries and Baptist, Baptist missionaries and other organizations come to Emmanuel Baptist Church and they, they would make a presentation and make a plea and they would what? Ask for some money. Not a bad thing, all right? Christians forever have supported one another financially. That, that's how we get things done, all right? It costs money to do ministry and that's not, a, that's not a wrong thing. It just does. And so you would have somebody come in and they would make a great plea. Be like, hey, we're going we're gonna to go do this. Uh, but we need some money. And you'd be like, the church would get together and they would pull their resources and they would give them that money and ministry would be accomplished. And they might come back in the future and, and ask for more and give an update and things like that. But there was, there was nothing stopping somebody else from coming the next week and somebody else from coming the next week and somebody else from coming a month after that. Do you begin to see what the issue might become? You begin to have to choose. Well, we gave to this person, and I mean, we love you, but we don't have anything else to give you because we've already given it all. Or when you have a smaller church that simply can't provide as much as a larger church. Again, nothing wrong with that, but it almost begins to be a competition between missionaries. Who can do the best job at raising the money that you need to go out and, and do the ministry that you need to do? Well, over time, Southern Baptists came up with a solution, okay, and that solution is what we call the cooperative program. So beginning in 1925, it was simply a way to streamline missions funding. So rather than each individual missionary being self-supported and having to raise their own funds by visiting all these churches, Southern Baptists decided to pull their resources and say, hey, we're going to give you guys a break from doing that, and if, if, if all the churches commit to essentially giving money to the pot, we'll distribute it and make sure that you have enough. All right, you can kind of see how this is a win for everybody. Again, there's nothing wrong with doing it the other way. It just begins to present some problems. A lot of denominations still operate like that. Again, nothing wrong with that. But you begin to see how much better it might be if big churches, small churches, all the medium-sized churches can pull their resources so that more ministry can be done especially with the missionaries not having to spend as much time asking for money, right? That's, that's less time asking for money and more time actually doing the ministry that they've been called to do. 
And so since 1925, that is how Southern Baptists have operated. And it really has enabled us to do a lot more things because we are cooperating together. Okay, so how does that actually work, though? All right, what are the nuts and bolts of this? This is directly from the Southern Baptist website, sbc.net. All right, this is what they say. Churches, and it's really simple, by the way. Churches support the cooperative program by submitting contributions through a network of state and regional Baptist conventions. Okay, so churches basically decide how much they want to give, and that's what, that's what they give. They give to, uh, they can give to local, and they give to state, and then the state conventions pass on a certain percentage of that to the national level. And then at the national level, that money gets spent doing a lot of different things. Again, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. So as Emmanuel Baptist Church, this is what we do. Um, we give 10% right off the top. So if you give a dollar, either online or in the, in the little kiosk or whatever, of every dollar that you give, 10 cents immediately comes right off the top and goes to the Georgia Baptist Mission Board through the cooperative program. And then the Georgia Baptist Mission Board combines all that with all the other churches giving through everybody else's giving and then sends that on to the Southern Baptist Convention at the national level. And then they distribute that as they have decided to do. All right. So we give 10%. Uh, we give an additional 2% to uh, the Savannah Baptist Association. Okay. And then we also give additional funds on a monthly basis to the Savannah Baptist Center. All right. So right at the top, we, we have committed as a church to give a considerable amount of our resources to something that we believe matters. And that is taking the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. So even though we might not be the ones doing that, we're not certainly the ones that are traveling around the world and traveling around the country and doing these kinds of things and planting churches. We support those that do. And that is an amazing thing. So that, that's how it works. These, these conventions use all that money to uh, you know, send the missionaries, to train pastors and ministry leaders, plant churches, uh, and a whole host of other things. So what does it support? Uh, there are a couple different things. Well, there's more than a couple, but here they are. And these are the things that you might hear from time to time, us talking about Southern Baptist entities. All right? These are groups within the Southern Baptist Convention that do the work of the ministry. All right, so we've got uh, missions and evangelism and church planting. Those are facilitated by two primary organizations. You have the International Mission Board, or IMB. Now, some of you guys have been around long enough to know that by a different name, it was the Foreign Mission Board. Now it's the International Mission Board. So that's the, that's the organization that does missions outside of North America. Because the other organization is the North American Mission Board. Again, some of you might have known that by another name, the Home Mission Board. Okay, now it's the North American Mission Board. And the North American Mission Board primarily focuses on mi missions and church planning in the United States and in Canada. Okay, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Andrew, I took geography class and there's more to North America than just the United States and Canada. And I understand you are correct. That's just how they have it organized, all right? So that's how we do the missions. Now, there are other things. So when we give to the cooperative program, it goes towards. So it goes towards missions internationally and here in the United States. Some of that money through the cooperative program also goes to support ministry education uh, and preparation, and that's through the seminaries. Okay. Now, as Southern Baptists, we have six of them. Like other denominations have other seminaries, but we support six seminaries here in the United States. Uh, the International Mission Board, by the way, also does do theolo provides theological training overseas. That's one of the things that they do too. But the ones here in the United States, there are six of them. Okay, there is, I, I got to start with the first one. It's the Southern Baptist Seminary. We get a laugh out of this. We used to joke about this in seminary because they like to call themselves the Southern Baptist Seminary. It's not that they're preeminent. Okay, they were just first. They got to pick the name, all right? It, it made me think about this in church. Did you know that, okay, so we are, we are Emmanuel Baptist Church, all right? There is a First Baptist Church in Savannah. I mean, there's a First Baptist Church of most towns, right? In Rhode Island, there is a First Baptist Church of America. 
And they get to call themselves that because they were first. I'm just saying, that's the name they picked. It's, it's not wrong. So there is the Southern Baptist Seminary. It's up in Louisville, Kentucky. All right, they were just first. That's why they get to call themselves that. Uh, there's also Gateway Seminary, uh, which is out west. And I say that not because I don't know where it is, because they have multiple locations now. All right, they have like five locations, and they're all out west, California and Arizona. All right, there's Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is in Kansas City, Missouri. There's New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, which is in, you guessed it, New Orleans. There's Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is in Fort Worth, Texas. And then there is Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is in Wake Forest, North Carolina. All right, I do have my preferences. I graduated from Southeastern. It's my favorite. I'm sorry. Like, it's just, there's, there's my bias. All right. Um, by the way, for, for, to be a Southern Baptist pastor, you don't have to go to seminary. Okay, there's, there's no rules about that. Remember what I said? The churches are autonomous and get to decide how they do things. The churches get to decide who they want to hire and what kind of education and credentials that person may or may not have. Okay? So while it doesn't help, it also doesn't hurt. All right? Some churches have decided, like I think ours has pretty much, like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to hire those guys. And that, I mean, that's, that's helpful. All right? We're all on the same page theologically, uh, usually like, strategically and all that kind of stuff so i i am preferential i'm I, i'll be transparent about that i won't hide that uh lane also went to southeastern that's where he got his doctorate from he mentioned that last week and so i feel like i can repeat that to you guys today uh we didn't actually know each other back then i think we might have had some time overlapping but i can't remember so you got the IB, you've got the north american mission board you've got the six seminaries oh by the way those seminaries also i think all of them they operate their own colleges as well, so you can go to college at a seminary if you want. Another organization that Southern Baptists, through the cooperative program, support financially is the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, or the ERLC. Okay, so this is the group that as Southern Baptists is put together to ad address Christian ethics and religious liberties ministries. All right, so th they handle all those kinds of things. Uh, the fourth Southern Baptist entity of sorts, and I say of sorts because they do not receive cooperative program funding, but their trustees are appointed by the Southern Baptist Convention, is Lifeway, okay? Lifeway Christian Resources. Or, again, if you've been around for a long time, you might know that as the Sunday School Board, all right? They, don't, they just don't call themselves that anymore. It's Lifeway Christian Resources. So they, they are a research and publishing house, all right? So... I want to say most, most of the curriculum that we use on, in Sunday school is published by Lifeway. Uh, and that's helpful for us because uh, they're usually on the ball. We agree with them theologically. For the most part, we don't predict that they're going to say anything crazy and off the wall that like, we have to come in and like, address because you learned heresy in Sunday school. Okay? It's, it doesn't work like that. So we, we're supportive of them. Uh, the next entity, so again, so you give to the cooperative program and the Southern Baptists and all that stuff, all right? Follow the, follow, the, follow the money here. You got Guidestone Financial Resources, although they also don't receive cooperative program funds, but they are a Southern Baptist entity. And what Guidestone does is manages ministerial retirement and insurance needs, okay? So they exist to do, like, pastors, like, retirement programs and insurance and things like that. Um, it's all optional um, and things like that. I want to point this out, though, because there are two groups you might hear about this week in the news, okay? One is what we talked about, Guidestone, okay? Guidestone does retirement. Guidepost, Guidestone, Guidepost is the company that the Southern Baptist Convention hired to do the abuse investigation, okay? So we've got Guidestone, we control them. Guidepost is a company that we hired, okay, because they could do the work um, better than better than anybody and so just make sure that you don't get those two confused because the names do sound very similar all right guide stone wait what did i say uh, guide stone guide post all right another southern baptist entity I know, I know we're getting in the weeds here but i promise this is important because i feel like it's, it's good that we we know these things and understand like what is the structure of our denomination we we you might understand what the structure of emmanuel baptist church is but beyond that what is the structure of our denomination Another Southern Baptist entity, again, you're going to hear about this, is the Executive Committee. All right, this is one of the bigger ones right now because they're the ones that through this 
third-party investigation, it's been shown that over the past 22 years, at least, they're the ones that have known about abuse in the convention and been the ones to like sweep it under the rug. And the investigation brought that, has, it has brought and continues to bring that to light. So the executive committee, I'm not saying they're, they're bad, they're not all bad people. As Lane shared with us, and again, if you go back and watch that recording, it was simply, it was a very small group of people. And if you weren't in that small group of people, you didn't actually know what was going on. And that's not, I mean, it's just, again, that's kind of how they, unfortunately, how it was. But the executive committee, what they do is they work to oversee the convention in between the time of the annual meetings. Okay, the Southern Baptist Convention, as a, con I mean, as a convention, only exists for two days out of the year. But, I mean, it's this week, it's Tuesday and Wednesday. The executive committee oversees all of its functions the other 363 time days of the year, okay? Um, I mean, the Southern Baptist Convention is a company with resources and assets and goals and plans and all that kind of stuff, and the executive committee are the ones who oversee it. They're overseen by 86 trustees, uh, and they have a president, he, and he is the CEO, and they have a small staff that oversee their offices and things like that. Uh, in addition to all those, we also have task forces within the Southern Baptist Convention, and these are kind of like limited operations. Uh, the com when the convention gets together and decides that there's a problem that needs to be addressed, like the abuse scandal, they, they appoint a task force to oversee that, okay? And then when the task force is done, the task force is no more. And then they just work on it and make more if they need to. But there is one other, there is one other very important organization within the Southern Baptist Convention. It's an auxiliary, uh, it's the only one of the SBC, and that is the WMU, okay? Women's Missionary Union. So what they do is they work closely with the International Mission Board and the North American Mission Board to encourage churches to give generously to missions. And they do that primarily through two offerings, which you might have heard of, because we do them here. At Easter time, we have the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And remember what I said about like the 10% goes to here and then they distribute it? Well, when you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, 100% of that goes to support North American Mission Board. And when you, at Christmas time, when you give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, 100% of that goes to international missions. Okay, none of that is held back, even for administration. None of that's held back. All right, so that's what happens. Those are the Southern Baptist entities that we, as a Southern Baptist church, support through our giving into the cooperative program. And you might be like, well, Emmanuel Baptist Church can't afford to do all that. And you'd be correct. This is why we have 47,000 other churches that also give to the cooperative program. So we can pool our resources and we can do so much more together than we can do apart. Okay, so that's how we do it. Now I wanna point out and clarify some other things because again, we're gonna be in the news this week. It's guaranteed. Now, what's gonna be in the news this week is almost anybody's guess. There's always something weird that pops out. Uh, they let anybody go. I mean, I don't think Lane's gonna make some crazy motion or anything like that, uh, but th there are sometimes, well, I mean, we're a family, right? How many of you guys have that one person in your family? Yeah, we've, we've got that in our convention too. And, uh, and, and anybody gets to talk in the microphone. So we'll, we'll see what happens. So while the Southern Baptist Convention is a denomination, all right, there's also the Southern Baptist Convention that is the two-day annual meeting. Okay, this is where the business of the convention happens. Now that the meeting location changes every year. This year, it's in Anaheim, California. All right, so that, that is where Pastor Lane is right now. So what happens at the meeting? I, th I think it's important for you to know because if you know this ahead of time, when you read the news or when you hear the news this week, you'll be like, oh yeah, that may, that I understand the context of it. So what happens at the meeting is that Southern Baptist churches send people to the meeting and they're called messengers, okay? Like we would send a messenger, like Lane, Pastor Lane is our messenger. Now the churches can usually send more than one uh, it depends on how much money they give to the cooperative program and a few other things like that. Um, it doesn't have to, everybody who's there is not a pastor, okay? This is not a convocation of pastors, all right? Like, my mom and dad are going, 
they're not pastors, all right? Uh, but their church, they, it's closer. So they, they are going uh, with people from their church. And the messengers will go to this two-day meeting. They'll hear reports from all of those entities, okay? So like the North American Mission Board, they will have, I mean, it'll be the president of the North American Mission Board. We'll get up there and he will make his report. And then the president of the National Mission Board will step up to the stage and he will give his report. Usually the presidents of the seminaries will get up and give their reports. Okay, what's the state of everything? How, is, how are we doing? All that kind of stuff. And then there will be more meetings um, at which other information is presented, motions are made, uh, churches and messengers from those churches say, hey, we think we should do this. And then they talk and deliberate about whether they should do it. And then they vote on whether they should do it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so th that's what's going to happen. Uh, there are two big things that, remember what I said I didn't know it was going to happen? Well, that's kind of not true. I, there are, I know two things that are going to happen at this year's, this year's convention. Okay, One, the, the abuse task force is going to make their report. I mean, that, that's their job. They were appointed to hire a third party to investigate the cover-up of abuse in the executive committee and then make a report at this year's convention. Okay, they started last year in Nashville, where the convention was, and then they'll make the report this year in Anaheim, where the convention is on Tuesday and Wednesday. So that's going to happen. They're going to make their report, and they're going to make their recommendations. I know you might be saying, well, why do they have to make a report when we already know what they're going to say? It's, it, it's just how it works, all right? They, they also made a promise that all that was going to be done ahead of time so that people could process so that when you attend the convention, you would know what was going on. It wouldn't just be this big bombshell surprise, although it was a big bombshell surprise. So that's going to happen. The task force is going to make their report. The other thing that is going to happen at this year's convention, it doesn't happen every year, and we'll talk about why here in a minute, is that the messengers will vote and appoint the next president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, to clarify, that's not the president of the executive committee. That's a different role. This is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And you can think about it like this. They're basically the public face. They're the leader, spokesperson, visionary of the denomination. Now, each president serves uh, a one-year term, okay? But they usually serve two consecutive one-year terms. Traditionally, they always run unopposed the second year, okay? Just the, just the way it works. It doesn't have to work that way. It just does. Okay? They serve two consecutive one-year terms, usually. All right? Now, what you're going to hear about is that the current president has decided not to use his second one-year term. Okay? He's decided to step down after serving only one year. So the president is nominated by somebody else at the convention, and then they're voted on. And the way that voting works... Um, they have to reserve a, they have to get a majority of the votes of the messengers that are present. Sometimes there are runoffs, okay? Uh, usually if there's runs off, runoffs, people will concede, but not always. Just like regular politics, right? Um, and then that, the new president will begin serving at the very end of the convention. So like Wednesday evening when everybody goes home, we'll have a new Southern Baptist Convention president. All right? That's kind of how it works. Now, I do want to be a little bit transparent here as well. Uh, I am not unbiased about the role of the Southern Baptist Convention president, and here's why. Uh, the current Southern Baptist Convention president, his name is Ed Litton. He's the pastor at Redemption Church in Sarahland, Alabama, and uh, we used to be, that, be at that church. Uh, when I was in college, that was, that was our church, and Pastor Ed was our pastor. Uh, we volunteered there. I interned there on staff for, for like a couple years. And uh, so, like I said, uh, I have uh, commitments like just in my heart. But I just want to be clear about that. So like if, I, if you ask me about that, I will have opinions. But uh, I'm not going to. This isn't the platform to share those with you. But uh, so the current pastor, the current president of the SBC uh, used to be my pastor. And to be even more transparent, the previous president of the SBC, J.D. Greer, who's the pastor at the Summit Church in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, was also my pastor when I was in seminary. That's the church that we were, that we were at for six years. And I, I joked with Lane that he's next, uh, but he said no. <laughs> no, <laughs> he has no aspirations for that at all. 
Now, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention can be anybody. It doesn't have to be a pastor, all right? It usually is, but again, it doesn't have to be. Now, are these guys perfect? No, okay? They would never claim to be. I would never claim for them to be. What is important is that whoever the Southern Baptist Convention president is, they simply lead Southern Baptist churches to cooperate better. How? With their heads, with their hearts, with their hands, and with their feet. Or you could think about it like this. Uh, raise, raise, how many of you guys ever had to go to the orthodontist? Orthodontist, all right, to get braces. I had mine for four years. I hated every minute of it. What does orthodontist mean? It means, ortho means right, and dentist means teeth. Okay, they help you get right teeth. If you think about it like this, you can think about how we cooperate with our heads. Well, that's orthodoxy or right belief. We cooperate with our hearts. Well, that's orthopathy or the right feelings about the right thing. We end up with our hands and feet, and that's, that's orthopraxy or the right practice of ministry. So your choice, my choice, to be Southern Baptist is yours to make. And I want to be clear, whatever you choose, we will love you no matter what. Now, some of you might say, um, but my family is Southern Baptist, so I could never leave. That's a fair point to make. All right. Perhaps your family unit is, is more collective than individualistic, like most of our Western culture. To you, I would say, maybe your family's onto something, okay? And you can lean into that more. Uh, going against the flow in your family never comes without its consequences. Jesus never promises that following him will be easy. In fact, he guarantees that for some families, he will turn one against another. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to that, think well about it. But some of you might say becoming Southern Baptist would mean abandoning my family. Well, Jesus also said that anyone who leaves father, mother, brother, and sister to follow him will have fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters now and in the age to come. You know, one of the reasons the Bible talks about us being a church family, being God's family, is that we are the family for people who need it. So, uh, to be clear, though, I, I'm not going to challenge you to be Southern Baptist in a way that's going to pad our numbers. Okay, would you record those things and would you send them in? Um, but it, I mean, the numbers matter because it represents a person and that person matters. You're, you might, when they talk about Southern Baptist in the news this week, you're going to hear a lot of numbers. Okay, you're going to hear, oh, the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Protestant denomination in the world. 47,000 churches. Nobody is bigger. That's true. You might also hear baptism numbers. Oh, I guess I should say, you're gonna, it's guaranteed you're going to hear this because this is when those numbers come out. Like, how many people did Southern Baptists baptize in the past year? I, I don't have the inside scoop on what that's going to be. Know that in the past, some, it's been lower than it has been in previous years. Everybody, sometimes we, we wring our hands can I tell you something? If that number was one, that's one more person who began a relationship with Jesus and got baptized. Do we wish for more? Of course we do, because it's more people having a saving relationship with Jesus. But when it comes to numbers, sometimes they might not matter as much. Uh, it's, it's like what leadership author Simon Sinek says. It's an infinite game. We're keeping score but nobody else is playing against us, okay? There is no winner in this. The game never ends. So you might say, oh, we have more baptisms, or we had less baptisms. Nobody's keeping score, except for us. Oh, we have more churches. Oh, we had less churches. Nobody's keeping score, except for us. We're the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. Nobody's keeping score, except for us. It's like me saying this. Emmanuel Baptist Church is the largest church in Savannah, next to the Oglethorpe Mall. Yep, we are. But nobody's keeping score, except for us, maybe. Maybe let's not do that. I say that to point out, again, it's not as a way for us to pat our numbers, for you to be part of us. So you're going to hear about everything that's, that's going on at the convention this week. 
Some of it's going to be good news. Some of it's going to be bad news. When Pastor Lane comes back, he has made a commitment to share with you what happens, or to share with us, not Jesus, with us. All right, he's going to do that not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. That's June the 22nd on our Wednesday Night Live Facebook platform. And even if you can't tune in, it'll be archived there and you can watch it whenever you want. So when you hear about it in the news, when you read about it in the news, be wise about what you hear. Okay? Remember, there's no such thing as unbiased reporting, even from the convention itself. Some news outlets are predisposed to love us. Some news outlets are predisposed to hate us. Some were somewhere in between. Okay? The real truth is just don't respond to the fear that might come out. Our, our response as followers of Jesus, as God tells us, is to fear not. He's the only one with us that we're supposed to fear. So it, it is during times like this when it is important for us to ask, how are we supposed to feel about the Southern Baptist Convention? Can we love it like we used to? I'm reminded about what uh, a brother in Christ said uh, a few weeks ago. You know, there are often many things that we can love. For some things, though, we have to have a mature love. We can love something knowing what its imperfections are, while also knowing that things can be better. And that is why we love it. So that, that's my hope and prayer for us today, is that we have a, a more mature love for the Southern Baptist Convention. And that after what we've, we've talked about today, that you can see what it means to be a Southern Baptist, including some terminology that maybe sometimes we just throw out there and, and don't really define. But my hope is that you'll see how much better together cooperating we can take the gospel to the ends of the earth when we cooperate with our head with our heart with our hands and with our feet and, and that invitation to be a part of that cooperating together is available to you okay if you would like to become a member at our church uh, there, there's processes and we would love to talk with you about what that looks like uh, i'll be available like when we're done i'll be out there Pastor Mark will be around, and we would, we would love to talk about what that looks like for you. Even if the next step for you isn't church membership, it might be getting baptized as a commitment to you following Jesus. We would love to talk with you about that. If you have questions about what it means to start a relationship with Jesus, to have your sins forgiven, to be reconciled to God, to have eternal life, we would love to talk with you about that too. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for uh, what you have done for us and giving us new life and forgiveness of sins, reconciliation with you through the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus. But even beyond that, God, you have given us You've given us a job to do. You've given us a commission to go out and tell other people about you and teach them how to follow you. I just tell them what you did, but disciple them. God, I pray that we as Emmanuel Baptist Church are able to make a renewed commitment to that, to do the work of ministry together, not only here in Savannah, but through things like the cooperative program, God, to support ministry that happens literally around the world. God, I pray to you that our commitment to that would be even stronger than it has ever been. God, for everything that's going to happen at the convention this week, God, we pray for the people that are involved. God, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them clarity and guidance. God, I pray that everybody who's there would exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. God, that they would be loving and joyful and, and peaceful and patient and kind and, and show self-control and be gentle with, with one another. Uh, there, are, there are important things that need to be talked about. But God, I pray that everyone would exemplify the spirit of Christ. And God, as, as our convention is literally under the microscope this week in front of so many people, God, I pray that they would see Jesus above all. God, we might not always have a good track record, God, but I, 
we need to have that kind of mature love that knows while we have imperfections, things can be better. And I, and I pray that they would be. God, I pray that we, as Emmanuel Baptist Church and as individuals who make up this body, would be the best reflections of you that we can. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. by singing the hymn Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. dismissed.